Hello and welcome to Chit Chat with Jed and Co, the show where everyone has their say. Today's show comes from St Mirren Football Club. Can we ask you please subscribe free to our YouTube channel, comment and give us a like. Now today's guest is a true St Mirren legend. He was Sir Alex Ferguson's youngest captain. He played for and managed the club on two occasions. He's played at the highest level in England. He's had to deal with personal tragedy in his life. He's worked with Glasgow gangs. He's lost his life savings along the way. An author of four books, current CEO of St Mirren Football Club. Welcome to the show, Tony Fitzpatrick. Thanks very much, Jed, and that was some intro you gave me there. Uh, just delighted to be on. It's great to have you here, Tony. It's been a long time coming, and I'm just desperate for the viewers to see your story because it's absolutely incredible. Now, a lot of people watching this show, mm -hmm. quite rightly so, I'll class you as a Paisley legend. Okay? But in fact, you're known as a greeting face dreamer for Possel. What's that about? <laughs> yeah, you're right there, Jed. Uh, no, I think the association goes back a long time with St Myrne and Paisley. So people uh, assume that I was born in Paisley because I've been such a long time attached to St Myrne. But I was born in Glasgow and I was born in a, a scheme called Possel Park, Possel, um, way back in the day. So... And that's where, uh, and the greeting phase <laughs> comes from, actually, as a kid, I was always crying all the time. My mum and dad always said if there was a, a sad film on or if there was an advert on it was sad, I would be bawling my eyes out, so they called me greeting face. You had a, you had a wee greet, Tony. <laughs> um, oh, there's nothing wrong with that. No. Any player worth their salt back in the day, Tony, played for the famous Postal YM. Were you any different? No, I wasn't, and it was a great honour to play for Postal YM. Before that, I had a year, my dad had started a team called Dundas Vale, and we played in the leagues, the Glasgow leagues and stuff, but that, after a year, my dad sort of gave up the, the, the football side of things, uh, running a team. So Postal YM was always a dream, as you said, to play for, and uh, I had a good pal at the time, Alec Ahara, who was a school friend, and he knew where Bobby Dinney stayed, the great Bobby Dinney. Uh, if MD ever mentions Bobby Dinney and Poso, I mean, he's an incredible man. Um, so me and Alec went up to Burdowie Street where Bobby stayed and we went up to the top flat and I remember chapping the door and uh, this great man answering the door, Bobby Dinney, and I was I was only a kid at the time and I asked him if I could get a trial for Poso YM. And he said, come in, son, and he took me and Alec in and we, we went into the room and there was... Oh, photographs of Kenny Dalglish and all different famous uh, players who had represented Postal and stuff. So he invited me along on the Sunday to have a trial and it was Tor Street, which is a black ash football park in the days. I went along and there was a lot of great players playing in that, uh, that park that day and I felt I struggled a wee bit. Um, but Bobby, after the game, said, right, son, OK, come along to train on Tuesday night. And I did come along and he signed me for Postal YM. And that was you, your kind of football dream, or your, your, your football road had started. Obviously, he started with your dad's team and yeah. now obviously the famous Postal YM. Now, I believe back in the day, Tony, Postal YM were a feeder club for a top English club. Who was that? Yeah, that's true. It was uh, Aston Villa and um, Postal YM were the nursery for Aston Villa. So that was an added bonus. For, so any kid that went and played for Posso YM had the opportunity, if they, they showed any talent at all, Aston Villa would take you down and sort of, you'd be down there for a week, sometimes a month, to try and get a contract there and be part of Aston Villa. So um, I struggled at the beginning, Jed, if I'm being honest. There was, I mean, in our team at that time, there was guys like Bobby Russell who played for Rangers and there was a great striker called Jimmy McCluskey. There were so many good players um, in that team and they were all getting down to Aston Villa and I was sort of getting left out at the time and I felt it very that very difficult. But there was a great uh, scout called Joe Hill who came from Paisley, stayed in Paisley, and uh, he'd sort of... Him and Bobby, Danny, of course, had still belief in me, although I was the one that wasn't getting invited down. So what had happened was uh, Joe Hill says, look... I was 12 at the time, and Joe Hill said, look, I'm going to take you through to my local club called St Myrne. And uh, he says, 
the train a Tuesday and a Thursday night, all the kids, he says, I'll give you extra training. He says, because, uh, and hopefully with that extra training, I'll bring you on and you'll get a chance to go down to Aston Villa. And that happened, actually. So f what had happened is a bit of luck. I'd been training for with St Mern for about a couple of months. But what happened was Aston Villa always invited one of the teams down for Postal YM to play against their youth team. And it so happened it was a derby. It was Aston Villa versus Birmingham. And uh, it was incredible because uh, we getting that invited down. And Aston Villa at the time, as I said, their youth team was big, big lads, you know, for England and all over. And uh, But it was, it was wonderful because I always remember this standing in the tunnel and down at Aston Villa. And I was a bit of a sort of, what you call dreamer at the time. Uh, they call it visualisation now, but as a kid, because of my background as well, education-wise, um, and, and it was well known when you come from post, so there was a lot of violence and stuff like that, and I found that very difficult. So I always wanted to be a footballer, so what I would do is, if I sat at the back of the class, or I would get in the bedroom myself and lie down, and I had a great, well, you say gift at the time, but of closing my eyes and dreaming about playing for whoever. It was always, I always remember shutting my eyes and I would be in the tunnel running out to a football plant. It was always Hamden at the time, to be honest. I would run out in Hamden and the crowd would be there and they'd be chanting my name uh, and that I'd be dreaming this. And I'd also commentate in the game in my head as well. So I would go through all that. And it was interesting how I'd done that every night or every day in life, having these dreams about being a footballer. And I remember standing in that tunnel, and you can imagine as a young kid, the noise, Aston Villa versus Birmingham, a derby, 30 to 40,000 people in that stadium. Now, we were going to play for 45 minutes before the big team went out. And I always remember standing in that tunnel, looking out to the park, and I felt very comfortable, Jen, because I'd lived Even that. Even at that age? Yeah, I'd lived that every day. And I looked about me, and it was strange because the English kids who were all taller, stronger looking, and even the Moan team that day, I looked about, and they were up, a lot of players were shaking, and you, know, you could see they were sort of, it was becoming a lot for them. But as I say, I'd lived that every day of my life. So when I ran out to the football part that day, and the crowd were all chatting. <laughs> well, I was imagining that. <laughs> they, were, they didn't know me. Uh, but I, I imagined that, and it was if this is where I should be. And uh, I must have done okay, because what happened from there was, um, after the game, Aston Villa uh, and Joe Hill and Bobby Dinney, I was invited in, and uh, Aston Villa said, look, we're going to ask you back down. Uh, for a month, and I did that. They actually started asking me back down for a month at a time to see if there was, you no, know, give me an opportunity to become an Aston Villa player. Fantastic. And how, how did how did that end up, Tony, uh, when you're obviously, you, you yeah. obviously never played for Aston Villa, but how did it end up well, at that age? It was incredible, yeah. I was still training with St Mern, remember, but coming for a scheme and coming for Porcel and stuff, and you know yourself, and it's strange, it's a good question, Jed, because... What happened is when I went up the road and then I was getting invited down, I was good to go for a month. Uh, the whole scheme was so proud of me. Uh, my mum and dad, of course, um, my family. So even I always remember my dad, no, I used to go down, it was my turn for the messages. I would go down and get my dad's paper and his cigarettes, my mum's cigarettes and stuff like that. And even in the news agents at that time, uh, everybody where I was walking saying, Tony, all the best, you're going to Aston Villa fantastic and you no, know, you're making the place proud and all oh, this and my mum and dad were so proud so going on quite a bit I went down to Aston Villa uh, this was my last time to go down to see if they were going to offer me something and I went away down there and I stayed there for a month and I played trained every day and Joe How Joe Hill sorry was down there a lot with me and that, again, you think you're doing really well. You no, know, you can tell yourself as a player if you're mm -hmm. struggling and if you're not struggling. I thought I'd done well. But I remember getting pulled in the last day and they sat me down. And I was all excited. Um, and 
the coaches at that time sat me down and said, look, Tony, we're just going to be totally honest with you. Um, we've looked at you now for a number of months, and especially this month, uh, and we're sad to say we don't think you're going to be a professional football player. We feel, and they were, they were brutal, <laughs> if I'm being honest, Jed. They said uh, they thought I wasn't tall enough, they Did thought you? I was too thin, they thought I wasn't quick enough, and they said, listen, I'm being honest with you, I don't think you'll ever play at professional football. So, if no, look at try to get a trade, stick in at your school and try and get a trade. But you can imagine the effect to that going back up the road. And it actually, and it happens to thousands of kids. But when I went back up the road, I felt a failure, if I'm being honest. No, when I went back to the street, no, your pals, of course, are slaughtering you and stuff like that because you never get picked. Uh, but I actually felt the effect in my family. My mum and dad, uh, my dad was a really proud man and well-known in that area. Um, and he actually <laughs> struggled even going to the pub and stuff like that. My mum stopped going to the bingo, believe it or not. But as a kid, that affects you. It's a big responsibility, yeah, Tony. Yeah, and I... I I sort of struggled with that for a while, if I'm being honest. Uh, one good thing was that when you come for the schemes as well and stuff like that, very early in life, you, you get a girlfriend and stuff. So Elizabeth, who actually was my girlfriend at the time, she was she was more pleased than MD. I never get picked up to, to sign for Aston Villa because that would be me going to England. But no, I did. I, I felt the whole scheme. But like anything, and I remember, but I never gave up. Jed, I always remember lying and thinking, and I know you can kid yourself on, but again, I kept that dreaming going. I kept going to my bed at night and lying and shutting my eyes and saying, no, I'm going to make it. And just luckily as well, I'd been still sticking in at St Myrna and they were showing us still a big keen interest so, uh, to keep so, me. So when, when you come back up the road, your English dream, obviously for that for a young yeah. age, it's died. Yeah. You're, you're, you've explained yeah. there, you know, how, how you were feeling. Yeah. And obviously you mentioned, so I guess you were still, you still went back and trained with St Myrna. I did. And um, again, St Myrna were fantastic with me. But there, as I say, I, what happens is I was about, here's a story, Jed, that six weeks to two months after getting uh, told all that way, uh, Aston Villa uh, of course I wanted to keep practice and I believed in myself and you mentioned uh, no, the place I came from and there's no doubt no, in the days and it's still to this day that there's gangs there's Postal Fleet there's Port Toy all the gangs were, were there and as I say my brothers were part of that as well I, I hung about with the boys I never looked at myself as a gang member they all knew I wanted to be a football player uh, but there was this day you can imagine six weeks to two months no a long time after getting that aye, big disappointment I was going to cross all the boys were going believe it or not were going to fight Sight Hill <laughs> and I had a football with me because I would walk so far with them and then I would go and practice and they would go and fight or whatever they were going to do but Lisbeth always came with me. Uh, yeah, she always came across with me and, and sometimes we'd go in the goals and I would shoot into the goals against her and stuff. But she always watched me practising and stuff. So this day I was walking across and the gangs, of course, my pals and all that were going on and I stopped. But all the way across, Lisbeth had sort of been saying, Tony, I need to speak to you, I need to speak to you. And I was like, yeah, no problem. And she went, no, I really need to speak to you. So at this time I'm 15 and a half or so, Elizabeth 16. Uh, so the boys have all went away and it's just me and Elizabeth left and she burst into tears. And uh, I was like, what's wrong? And she went, I'm scared to tell you, but I have to, I have to tell you. And I was like, what is it? She went, I'm pregnant. Christ. So. Such a young age. Yeah, I was, I said, I was coming up for 16. Elizabeth was 16. Um, and it's a fantastic blessing now because my daughter Lorraine was born, of course. Um, but at that time, I'll be honest with you, with the disappointment with Aston Villa, Elizabeth saying this to me, and I'll I'll be totally honest as well. It was a real, uh, as I say, it's a blessing now. But at that time, I was terrified because my family and I thought Elizabeth's family, and uh, no, you know yourself and. 
Glasgow or wherever, we were two different religions as well, and the families used to fight with each other. So you can imagine what sort of um, we had to sit in front of her mum, uh, and then sit in front of my mum and dad. Uh, but luckily at the time, my gran was still alive, and in the, the days, your gran was very important. Yeah. She was a sort of the power of the, the family, yet yeah, kept it all together. And I always remember that conversation. My dad was really, and I loved my dad to bits, but he was really angry with me, you no, know, because uh, he gave, he actually was staring at me, and my gran says, well, you're going to do the right thing, son. You're going to uh, marry. Elizabeth and I said yeah and I, I wanted to but I had to wait to a week after my 16th birthday and I get married to Elizabeth Incredible and obviously reading your book um, yeah. at that stage obviously uh, Lorraine was born Yeah. you were you had your knockbacks for Aston Villa yeah. you were still training up at St Murn, but you were, you were kind of thinking of giving the game up all together weren't you? Yeah Jared it's incredible how life happens because you see then I, I went to St Murn. a uh, I actually signed for St Murn and the chairman at the time was a, a man called Willie Todd and as I said my education uh, and a lot of people do know this but don't know it but uh, I suffer, say suffer, but it was I have dyslex, uh, dyslexia as well, I can't even say that properly there, but uh, I had that as well. So education wise and if I'm being honest you know, I never really had an interest in education, I wanted to be a footballer. so. Um, I was never going to do anything. Aston Villa always stuck my head about saying get a trade. And St Mern at that time, remember, were a second division club. Yeah. They were way down the bottom. And uh, Willie Todd, to be fair to him, I, I'd get married and I'd Lorraine to support as well and my wife as well, Elizabeth. So Willie Todd had said, look, why don't get you a trade? Willie owned a painter's and decorator's yeah. place. And to be fair, I wasn't much a decorator, but in the days I used to go travel out to Cumbernauld. Uh, there was a big sites getting built up there and I used to do all the painting up there and all doing all the priming of the wood and going through that. And I was going to set my trade up as being a painter and decorator. Um, it was a great, although uh, Willie Todd started a great man called Whitey Fleming and he looked after me and uh, used to drive me through to Cumbernauld at times and stuff like that to do all the painting. So I, I started playing part-time with St Murn and there was also a painter and decorator in the days. So you can imagine that was going on and you were asking the question about, you, you sort of yeah, thinking about chucking it. And I was because things were happening. What happens is, as a young man, I, no, by this time I'm coming up for near 17 or so, um, Elizabeth, we were young people, no, it's a, it's a big responsibility, Tony, for, for somebody your age. It, it is. I look at some of the academy kids now and up when I go up and I look and I think, God, I was married at that age. But it was a big responsibility and I was so immature, as I said, at that age. Uh, my dream was still there to be a footballer. And it's at Mum. Things weren't progressing the way I wanted either. I was working all day. I know that was a normal thing in the days. But... If I'm being honest as well, I was giving Elizabeth a real hard time because I wasn't making it in football. Uh, I was full of frustration, what had happened at Aston Villa, no making it the way I should be at St Murn. And uh, a great thing then, my life turned around actually because what happened then is just after a few months or so, Willie Cunningham left uh, St Man, who was a great guy as well and Sir Alec Ferguson was made manager of St Man. Oh, uh, in the days Alec Ferguson it wasn't Sir Alec Ferguson and again there's a, a story behind that I'll carry on if you, oh, if you think do, yeah. Tony, absolutely. Um, what happened was Alec Ferguson came to the club and very it was a, you could see straight away there was something special about this human being this man no just passion but caring and he was he was driven you could feel all that I'd actually had pleurisy at the time so I, I was struggling and um, so when Alec came in at first he never got a real chance to look at me uh, just a few training sessions and stuff like that and what happened was I remember going home one night um, after work and Alec the day before had said listen I'm going to uh, 
Tuesday night training, I'm going to get you all in and I'm going to speak to you individually and stuff like that. So I went home that night after that talk and Elizabeth's getting her bags ready to go with Lorraine. And I, in the days I stayed in Springburn, it was just, people know at my age, it's called a single end. It was just one bedroom. The toilet was outside in the, in the close. Um, so I went up the stairs after finishing training and uh, my work and then training with Fergie and then he was going to speak to us the next night, next training night. So I've walked in the house and Lisbeth's all packed and I went, put so on, she went, I'm going back to my mum's story. She went, I've just, she went, I've had enough because I said, I was so immature. I was, I was taking all my frustrations out in her, although physically I never hit her. Mentally, I was driving yeah, her and you, crazy. You, yeah, you had a lot in your mind as well, Tony, for a yeah. young man. Yeah, definitely. And Elizabeth was the same because she gave up her dream as well. She wanted, she had a career she wanted to do, and she gave it up to look after Lorraine and stuff like that. So, and myself. So anyway, she sort of, I spoke to her for a wee bit, and I convinced her. I said, "Listen, I'm going to meet the the new manager." I'll be honest with you, I don't think I'm going to get taken on. So what I'm going to do, and I promise you this, I'm going to give football up. I'm going to be a painter and decorator. I'll concentrate on you and Lorraine. And, but I'll go and see the manager. I'll face him and tell him that's me finished. But I'm going to, and, and we spoke away for hours and hours. And she went, do you promise me, Tony? She went, because, no, she knew as well I wasn't really getting anywhere. I was coming in for no, my work, going out training all night and just everything was selfish, it was about me and uh, so she went, right, okay, I'll stay. So for there, what happened then was uh, the following nights, we went in and uh, we're all in the dressing room and Sir Alex up the stair, I'll call him Alec now because there wasn't Sir at that time, Alec was up the stair and everybody was so nervous in that dressing room, no, because there was senior players there, there was guys at the age of 30, 33 yeah. year. I'm a, coming up, you know, 17 and a half or whatever I am at that age. And uh, we're all nervous because Alec had been in for a, a, a spell and you could tell he was driven and he wanted the best for St Mern and all these things. And uh, I thought, right, he's going to take Here, we go. Here, we, go Here again. we go again. And the dreaded, <laughs> I thought, was going to happen because within minutes... The dressing room door opened and it was um, Ricky McFarlane at the time. And he looked about the whole dressing room, Jed, and he goes, um, Tony, the gaffer wants you up the stairs. <laughs> so he walked out, I'm first up. And I thought, oh my God. <laughs> and some of the boys, the experienced boys, came over and said, listen, um, don't worry, no, D just go up and do what you have to do and all that and blah. But you know, Alec in the days was quite, um, not ferocious, but he, he could, he, he demanded things that you know. So I, I went out, yeah. So I went out to the dressing room. I stood, if ever, if anybody knew the old Love Street, there was two staircases and I stood there, I always remember this, and I looked up and I thought, eh, I'm not going up these stairs. I'm going to go home because there was an exit you could <laughs> just go out. And I was panicking because, and then I was fighting my mind because I was saying, do you know what? Uh, I'm going to tell Mum Chuck it anyway. You know. Not jealous of you. Yeah, but that, I was having that fight in my mind and Ricky came to the top of the stairs and he looked and he went, Tony, hurry up, the gaffer's waiting on you. So I went, OK. So I ran up the stairs and I always remember going along and chatting Alex's door and I can't do his voice or anything like that, but there was a come in type of thing and I opened the door and this is true and it, <laughs> I don't know if you'll remember, but... At school, used to when I talked about being a dreamer, I would go into that dream, and the school teacher at times used to pick up a set of keys or a duster and show them at me, and to wake me up, you no, know, and shout at me and stuff like that. So as I walked in the door, Alex sitting behind the desk, and uh, there was a big set of keys beside him, and honestly, Jed, yeah, I, I did. Learn behaviour or whatever, I walked in and I, I looked and I went, he's going to throw these keys at me. <laughs> but he wasn't, he? and I, no, I was... looked at him looking at me and he goes, Tony, come in. And I was like, I was still wearing his like, sit down. Now, where I came from in life, 
offended me. I was thinking I was going to sit down and he'd come over the top of me and say, you're this or that. It was, I was yeah. young, your thing's going through your head. So I sat down and I was so nervous and he's going, are you okay? And I'm going, yeah, yeah. And Jed, I wanted to say to him, listen, Save your I'm breath, finished. I'm yeah, I'm finished. I know what you're going to say to him. I'm too wee, I'm right. too... All the things what I get told at Villa. But listen, anyway, I'm, to, I'm, I'm going to go and be a painter and decorator or whatever. And I remember him looking at him and he goes... Uh, you okay? And I went, I, uh, and I couldn't get the words out. And luckily, I never got the words out because I remember him looking and he pointed at me. No, no, badly. He just put his, his point and he went, Do you know something, Tony? He says, I've been watching you and I've been watching you very closely, son. He says, and Do you know something? You've got huge potential. Now, I didn't even know what that meant at the time. But I knew by his actions, it sounded okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was like, ah. And he, was, he went, not only have you got huge potential, he says, this football club's got huge potential. He says, do you know in five years' time? He says, we'll not even uh, be challenging Celtic. We'll be beyond them. He says, we're going to be winning leagues, cups. He says, we'll be in Europe. And I think of this, right? And he pointed at me then and he went, and I want you to be my captain. Do you believe the things I'm saying to you? And I was, yeah, yeah, yeah. He went, right, you come with me then. And we walked down the stairs. Okay. And I remember his walking in that dress room and all the no, players wait, lying, was... And they're looking at me after saying, I'm, I've kept my thing. And he went, listen, guys, um, I'm going to get you up one by one, talk to you, uh, listen. And he actually spoke about his ambitions for St Mern uh, in front of them all. And he turned and he went, and this young man here is going to be the leader in the part for his. And uh, he clapped and everybody just sang, clapped through the nerves. But um, I was elated, so he went away. And then you were to get ready to go home or whatever. But imagine, Jed, from that elation, I was going, oh, fantastic. But as I was getting ready, I went, oh, no. Oh, no, you've... I've, <laughs> <laughs> you've told I've told Elizabeth what I'm chucking football, so... <laughs> But I remember this is and this is what you talk about. So I got myself ready. I've j jumped the train, got the bus up to Springburn. As I told you, I stayed at the top flat in Springburn and Bedley Street. So I've right up the stairs. I've went in to the the room because there was only one room. Elizabeth at the time was putting young Lorraine down, and she turned round and you've got this maniac running. I must have been so excited. They talk about energy or whatever, and I went, Elizabeth. You'll no believe it. I'm saying, I'm going to be captain of St Mern. We're going to be winning leagues. We're going to be in Europe. And I'm getting a new contract. And, and she was looking at me. And in the days, she must have been looking, thinking, is he been sniffing that glue? <laughs> <laughs> all the boys, you know, you're saying in the days, all the boys done that. Or has he been drinking or something? She knew I didn't drink or sniffed the glue. But she, <laughs> the way I was acting. And I went, but I'm a great believer in energy, Jed, and see the way I said it and the way I done it. She, I remember her coming over to me and gave me a big hug, and she went, no, you really believe you? I said, yeah, and and great. And she, she spoke about this book, I'll never forget it to this day. Uh, it's a book called Eat to Win, Dr. Robert Haas, and Elizabeth got, the next day went and got me that book. And it was, it was about a tennis player... Um, a rugby player and a football and it was all about diet so you can imagine a wee even a back in the day so then that's uh, I started then as I say and that, that was you that was me now you talk about Alec Ferguson yeah. as he's known now the yeah. great man as you call him yeah. Sir Alex Ferguson I know yeah. you're still close to him yeah. to this day mm. but Tony you must have some fantastic personal stories. Tell us a couple come on yeah <laughs> there's always stories as you say about Alec what I do have to say is, as you say, I keep saying that, the great man I call him, and, and he really is because, and you hear even footballers for his Aberdeen days and his Man United days, guys like Ronaldo look upon him like a second second father. Now, that's just no about football. No. He's a man that cares about your family, about your life, about everything. He loves and cares for you, and that's that's what's special about him as well. Um, so I'll say that first, but yeah... There's, um, again, as a young player, made a young team with the Frank McGarvey's, Billy Starks, and I don't want to miss them do it because there's so many in that team, which was incredible. Um, 
and I always remember how driven he was, as I said to you, and and I remember one of the games, especially early, very early on, we're on the dressing room and uh, Alex sort of there giving his motivation. He always loved to sort of. He was a great motivational speaker in terms of. Uh, try to get you up for the game. Although you, as a kid you want to play, but he gave you that extra thing, feeling about being proud of playing for something and all the things. But I always remember this days we're all sitting and it was going to be, of course, um, a, a hard game. And Alec comes in and he's looking about and he's saying, right lads, he's saying, I know this is a tough game of day, but listen, no use. and we were on a good bonus and stuff like that in the days to win the games. And he's, he always started with me, the, the captain, captain, and I always remember him turning to me and he goes, Tony, and I was waiting in this, you no, know, get on the ball or whatever, but he went, Tony, son, he says, I'm just looking, he says, and I seen you the other day, he says, um, with your daughter Lorraine, he says, what a beautiful young girl. No, she was only a toddler at the time. And he goes, eh, and I hope you don't mind me saying this, he says, but he says, I look at Lorraine, he says, what a lovely girl, he says, but there's one thing, and I know what he says, she needs new shoes. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, ah, she did really, but I was going, hi boss. Hi, no, but she did, and I'm <laughs> going, and he goes, um, what a girl, and he, he turns quickly to Frank McGarv at the time, he's going, McGarv, son, he says, eh, I know, he says, your granny's in the hospital, she'll be lying up there. She went, he went, but you know something, he says, there's one thing which she'll be listening for the day in that radio and stuff like that is for McGarvey to score the first goal. So he, he, was, he used everything and he says, but there's one thing he says, when he went back to Lorraine, he goes, can I say something? There's Tony's daughter Lorraine, are you going to allow that team through there to take your bonus? So is Tony's daughter, can I get shoes? <laughs> Psychological Psychological, oh, but he was brilliant. Genius. I mean, he was absolutely brilliant. That was very early in his, his thing. He, he knew you as a person which really got you going, my daughter or my, you no know, Frank's family yeah. listening. And he, he, he would do that on a regular basis. He would did sort of come in and have these talks and that. I mean, to go, and he would talk about Paisley as well, you knowing the people of Paisley. So it, you felt so proud. You, you went out there, nice. 100 foot tall, representing St Murno. So that was uh, one of the stories there. There's, there's others I, I could sort of... I know I was reading the book as well. There, yeah. was, there was a special story about how he used to get into the brains of the referees. That was, <laughs> yeah, that was very, it was very clever, as I say, way they talks. And if people knew Love Street as well, the referee could hear everything that was going on yeah, in knew. the dress rooms, and he knew that. So he would use that. He would go up against the wall where the referee could hear through the wall, <laughs> and he'd be shouting, he'd be going, listen, we know we're playing Aberdeen today, eh, and we know they're the dirtiest team in Scotland, and they'll be kicking lumps out of you, McGarve, and Tony and Starkey and Lexi, and all the, the Robert Tons, he would shout all the names he went, but do you know something? We've got the best referee in Scotland today, and he'll <laughs> not allow that to happen to you. So it was, it was brilliant. all these things. It was brilliant, yeah. As I say, there's a separate show and all his things, oh. but what that man done for Paisley uh, and St Mum Football Club uh, has been incredible. He's been the same I've, I've, oh, everywhere he's been. The, the, the guy's a genius, uh, and yeah. I, I've I had the pleasure of meeting him uh, yeah. one time during England, and, and, yeah. and I remember my day I met him, um, you know, everything's kind of going on about him and how, how yeah. you said Alex and he heard my accent uh -huh. and obviously I mentioned yourself to him yeah. and, and he came right over and, yeah. he's, he's, and I've no, I know you're still in touch with him to this day. So, yeah. so obviously that was you, you were someone captain, yeah. um, obviously playing under the great man, but your yeah. time came to leave St Mum. Uh, what was your options? Yeah, it was sad because what happens is, and I need to bring this up, um, it's probably the biggest ever mistake in the history of uh, Football uh, St Mum let Alec Ferguson mm -hmm. leave, uh, which was incredible. And, and I must say, Jed, and I've got to make this clear, I'd have never left St Mum. Mm -hmm. uh, I left because Sir Alec left, and I'm being honest. And they started, Jim Clooney came up, who was a really good manager, and I got in great with him. I was still captain, of course, but 
with Fergie going, uh, and they, st they started to sell players like Frank yeah. McGarvey and stuff like that, and I thought, and I'd, I'd actually been, I went to a tribunal, Fergie had went to the tribunal against St Mum because, again, I still believe he was he was wrongly sacked. And I mean, how could you sack somebody no. like that has done so much for the club? And um, as I say, I wanted to leave, yeah. So I went to uh, the manager at the time and the chairman. I said, listen, I, I want to leave. Um, and I was really wanting to go to Aberdeen um, and... Alec was interested in me and Celtic were interested in me at the time. But in the days, the clubs had the power. So what they did is they sat me down and said, look, we're not going to allow you to go to another Scottish club like Cel uh, Celtic or Aberdeen. And Sir Alec then had been, he'd become Aberdeen's manager. And they says, if you're going to go, then we'd prefer to sell you to England. And I had the options of um, Leeds United, Bristol City and of Aston Villa. Aston Villa. Yeah, and you're only that's interesting. Very interesting, because you can imagine uh, when Aston Villa get mentioned because I'd played for Scotland under twenty ones against England, and um, down in England, and I'd done pretty well in the game and stuff like that. And that's where the, the sort of interest came for all these clubs, and uh, so I went to see every club. I went as I went down. Uh, and this is where you regret, and like sometimes, uh, say regret, I never, because my time at Bristol, I picked Bristol City, as everybody knows, I went and played, and they were in the, the top league at that time, it's the equivalent of the Premiership now, great clubs like Liverpool, with Dalglish, soon they saw yeah. these guys playing, and Man United's, and Ipswich at that time were a oh, fantastic they were, they were, football club. Is that club. the team that Paul Marner played? Yeah, with, and Alan I mean, Brazil they won the, the time, European the, the Cup, the Winners Cup, Cup, yeah. The UEFA Cup in 1981, I believe. Phenomenal. Great team. So, but there is a story behind the Aston Villa one. Um, That's interesting. Yeah, it was interesting. And you say we regrets in life. I do regret that because what happened was still very young. You know, I mean, I was, um, and remember, I, at 15, I'd been told we, Aston Villa, I was too small, too thin, no quick enough. I would never play professional <laughs> football. And I went to Aston Villa to tell them at the age of 20 now, 20, coming up for 21, but they wanted to buy me. So How, how it goes round it. But, you know, it's, it's something... Uh, I went to see them anyway. I spoke to Leeds United. I spoke to Bristol City. I went to Aston Villa and I sat. And some of the coaches were still there. They asked Aston Villa who'd said this to me. There was a new manager in, mm -hmm. uh, Ron Saunders. But anyway, I had a, I had a chat uh, with them. And, do you know... It was stupid in a way, but the manager said at the time to me, eh, Tony, we've watched you and we're really keen on bringing you to the club, da, 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 and I went, right. And But something triggered me when he went, eh, we don't know if you're ready for our first team yet. And you know, all ghosts and nightmares came up. And I went, what? And he went, but we no, want you here and we'll work with you. And I went, I wouldn't have come here. Because, again, I looked, at, there was a couple of coaches who had been there that were now his first team coaches. And I went, I'm telling you now, I'm not coming to Aston Villa. I says, um, no getting your first team. And it was it was silly and I acted stupidly, but I got and I walked out. I did, yeah, yeah. Then it was, but I do regret it because it was, Again, that's where people in life, you've got to learn to sort of uh, handle these things. Thing. But I was still very immature. Aye. Do you know what I mean? But I'm glad I, I went to Bristol City and it was a fantastic football club. And I mean, it was it was a beautiful place to stay as well. And it was myself and uh, Elizabeth and Lorraine. And uh, Tony had been born Aye. as well. And so it was... So life uh, was good. Yeah, life was fantastic. Life was good. Just before we go on to the next point. Yeah. What uh, can it happen to Aston Villa in about that time the next year? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for amazing me, Jed. Yeah. yeah, I know they'd signed Des Bremner, who's a fantastic player. Some, something big happened. Uh, they did, yeah. About, it was more than a year, but it was about 18, 18 months later, the Ron Saunders turned the whole club round. <laughs> and uh, and he's probably right. I wasn't ready for the first team, but they went on and won the European Cup. 
Uh, which was yeah, anyway, Bristol yeah, that's Bristol. right. Yeah, and I, Bristol, I would not, well, would I change it? No, <clears> because <throat> Bristol was a beautiful place for the family to stay, and I loved the club as well. No, and I, I do you know something? No, to play, I missed one game for Bristol City, and it was against Aston Villa, believe it, I know, at our part, but two. Two games in to my career down in Bristol, we went to Aston Villa and won two nothing. And I thought, oh, I've made the right choice, but to be fair, they went Listen. on. But I did. I, I, I love my time at Bristol City. Now, obviously, your your time was up at Bristol. Yeah. What was your thoughts? Where did you want to go? Did you have any ideas? Yeah, well, it was a strange thing because what had happened is Alan Dix was the manager of Bristol City, left, and Bob Houghton and Roy Hodgson came in. And Roy Hodgson and Bob Houghton were phenomenal. Uh, so was Alan Dix, to be fair, but he'd left and they two came in and took the team and they took a real liking to me. Uh, Roy Hodgson uh, became manager. Uh, Bob Houghton went away um, to America and Roy really took a real liking to me as a player and stuff and made me captain and uh, we were doing really well. But Roy came to want me one day and got us in and said, look, Tony, I've had to sell Jerry Gow to Man City, Joe Royal to Norwich. These are names mm. people know. And he says, the club's in real trouble. So you're next in the list. We need to sell you. And I don't know how you feel about it. He says, eh, Leeds United are quite interested in you. He said, if you wanted to stay in England. Um, but I'll be honest as well, it, it's... There was interest getting shown because I get back in the Scotland squads with playing under Roy, and there was interest shown by Celtic, Aberdeen, of course, with Sir Alec, and uh, St Mum, who Ricky McFarlane was manager, and Louis Kane was the chairman of St Mum, who I had a real close relationship with. Um, so there was three Scottish clubs interested. So we spoke about it, and at that time, as I say. We thought, let's go back up the road. Uh, and, I, and I thought, I'll be honest with you, I was going to sign for Aberdeen because okay. of the Fergie thing. And, uh, but in the days, as you know, the team that bid the most money got you. Uh, no, again, the powers were the club. But I actually uh, sp spoke to Alec and Celtic um, as well. But what happened was Ricky McFarlane was manager and I had a great relationship with, with Ricky. And as I said, Louis Kane was the uh, the chairman of St Martin. And can I quickly just go back to a story with Louis Kane? Because what happens is when I was a young kid, you said about being a dreamer. When I first went to St Martin, Louis Kane uh, used to help out at St Martin. He would actually even help with boots and do stuff. And this was the guy who ended up being chairman of St Martin. But me and Louis, and Louis, uh, I always wanted to have the ambition to own a house in Thornley Park in Paisley. Okay. And I used to talk to uh, Louis Kane about it and stuff like that. So after training, he used to drive me up to Thornley Park and see about dreams, you talk about visualisation. Yeah. I used to sit, Louis used to smoke and stuff, so he'd go away and s smoke or whatever. But I used to sit in his car. Or sometimes I would go outside and I would close my eyes and it was a beautiful house there I always wanted to to own, and I could imagine Elizabeth in the house at the time with Lorraine, and of course Tony's here now, but this was a way back my St Martin when I first went. And um, so anyway, that take that, remember that, which this house was so important to me, and I always dreamt about owning it. So I came up, I spoke to these these teams, and I spoke to um, Ricky McFarlane, I was, Ricky was a top manager, you, know, you talk about Alec Ferguson, or brilliant, but, and Jim Clooney was good, and uh, uh, Alec Muller, of course, but Ricky McFarlane was a fantastic football manager, and I wanted to play under him. Uh, but it was the chairman, to be fair, made me really change my mind, because as we were talking, and they said, listen, Tony, we can't give you the money you're on here in the, uh, England. And he was saying, but no, I know you're keen to come back to St Mum and stuff like that. I went, do you know something? He says, remember I used to drive you up to Thornley Park? And I went, uh -huh, yeah. And he went, remember that house and all that? And I went, yeah, and this is true, yeah. And he was going, it's up for sale. He says, and uh, we can help you try and get that. No, so that sealed it for me as well as wanting to come back to St Mum. So I did. I came up. OK, Tony, obviously you went back to St Mirren. Yeah. But during the interview, you, you told us you had a couple of chances to sign for Celtic. Now, I believe 
you scored against your dad's beloved Celtic. <laughs> How did that go down? <laughs> <laughs> oh, not too well, Jed. Honestly, my, my dad is a, he's a fantastic man and supported me all my, all my life through the football. But he was you no know, hiding the fact he was a big Celtic supporter and always wanted me to play for Celtic. And uh, it never ever happened. So, but you're right. I came back and uh, played against Celtic, and we won. And uh, as you say, I scored at Parkhead, and I remember scoring. I, I ran across to the stand. And I tumbled my walkies. <laughs> I was delighted. I wanted to really, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, after the game, I always remember it. Elizabeth and my dad used to wait on me after every game. So I came out Parkhead that day and I could and I was so pleased because players will tell you and people know there's games I was terrible in and played bad and you feel bad. And not just because I'd scored against Celtic, but I felt good that day. I felt I'd played really well in the game and I was so happy. So I came out anyway and Elizabeth, I could tell with her face and my dad had turned his back and Elizabeth was to me looking and <laughs> uh, so he comes round and my dad smoked in the days as well, right? So I'm walking with him and he's smoking away and he goes, um, and he's spitting a bit as well at the side and he went, uh, I don't think you've done well today. And I was like, what? Cool. <laughs> I know, I went, so, aye, ah, see that was, it was, your goal was quite lucky. You shouldn't have. And I'm looking at him and I'm going, and he's going, um, nah, he says, we're giving the ball away a lot today, this and that. and. I says, Dad, I thought I'd done well. I says, we've won, we beat Celtic. So I was stick. you could see his face. But anyway, after the game, I used to always go back to my dad's house, my mum's, my mum and dad's house. And uh, although my dad, uh, beloved Celtic, I had brothers as well, who used to, in the days, go in the jungle. Uh, oh. People know that. and um, Supported Celtic. They were mental. <laughs> and uh, so I went back home, my, my mum of course was there, so, oh well done the day's done, and my dad oh. could see he was raging, and just about 10 minutes in I'm having a cup of tea, and here my brothers come walking in, and uh, they were acting, like, yeah you're a traitor, and you know, started you know, giving me stick and all that, and my dad, I always remember dad going, oh shut up, he says I've gave him up already, he knows. <laughs> 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 so it was that unbelievable, was but that was yeah. what they were like. And they were, to be fair, at the end up, the, I mean, my dad supported me all through my football career, um, as I say. But I was as proud as punch, and that was one of the brothers went, "You didn't need to tumble your walkies." So, yeah, yeah. So Tony, you're back at St. Mum. Mm -hmm. You're living in your dream house. Yeah. With your beautiful family, your wife your son and your yeah, daughter. Yeah. Then your world fell apart. Yeah, very much so, Jed, as you said. Um, just back to St Mern, scoring against Celtic. Things were going well at St Mern. Uh, Lorraine had started in school, St Charles's school, and uh, Tony was four and a half, and uh, a matter of six weeks or so, we, we put him into a school, St Charles's, where Lorraine was going as well, in Paisley, and uh, life, as you say, was unbelievable. I was, uh, I was back at St Mum, had a beautiful house in Thornley Park Avenue, had a beautiful car. I'm not being big head when I say that, but in the days, I had quite a bit of wealth as well in the bank and whatever. Everything was perfect. But as you say, tragedy stuck. Uh, struck. It was um, Tony had just started the school, and within a month or so, became very unwell, and uh, really unwell. So we took him to doctors a few times and stuff, of course, and the doctor had been out. But uh, anyway, this day, that this day, I'd come down the stairs, and Elizabeth had been, been cradling Tony in her arms, and uh, she with a real hard night with Tony, so. Um, Elizabeth said, I said, listen, on the way down to training, I'll drop into Dr Colin Reid at the time, who was a fantastic doctor in Paisley, Nielsen Road. So I said, I'll pop in and see if he'll come up and see Tony after surgery. So she went, oh, aye, that'd be great. But as I was going out, you know, you look at him and I was sort of feeling his head and stuff like that. I noticed there was wee purple spots all over him. And naively, I'm thinking it's probably the me, it's something. 
So I goes down to the doctor's surgery, um, just at reception, and luckily Dr. Uh, Reed came out, um, and he's like, and he must have seen the thing in my face, he went, Tony, everything okay? Because he'd seen Tony a couple of times. <clears throat> I went, yeah, just Tony's really unwell, he's been really bad last night, and he's no really hot and really thing, and he's going, oh, right. He went, I'll come and get me. He went, how bad is he? What, what's he? I went, and I mentioned the purple spots, and he went, listen, Tony, could you come up and bring him down? Could you, is he fit enough to come? I says, oh, I can get him in the car and bring him down. So I did that, I went up and Lisbeth jumped in the back of the motor with him. We dropped into Dr. Reed's and uh, within minutes, uh, he says, right, okay. So we went to Hawkhead Hospital and from there, within half an hour from there, he was rushed to uh, York Hill Hospital, Children's Sick Hospital in Glasgow. And uh, I always remember it, you know, it was a whirlwind where they took us up the stairs and uh, we were put in a room and Tony was rushed away um, and it went on for hours. And of course, you are, and the sister at the time, the nurses were great and they were coming in saying, look, just we're working away and Tony, don't worry and blah, blah, blah. So, Dr. Willoughby, uh, who was a fantastic doctor at the time, he ended up going to Australia actually to work. But Dr. Willoughby came in with his sister and they sat down and they, they sort of said to us, look, um, we're really concerned. Tony's got uh, meningitis and he's uh, septicemia. He's in a real bad way. Um, and whether they, we can he say, but he's rejecting treatment and stuff like that, so um, more or less that was Tony was going, they never put a time on it, but they said, listen, go and spend time with him, he's, um, he's in such a bad way, so we went through there and of course you're, you know, the family, you no, know, to let the family know and stuff like that as well. So um, I went out the room because some family members come up with that, different ones were coming up and Lorraine and a different one. So as I walked out, there was a, and I've got to say this, um, Father Joe Dunn was standing in the corner, uh, in the corridor, sorry, and in York Hill Hospital, they had a Father Joe Dunn and they had a minister uh, used to come in and, and you know, uh, service the sort of hospital. So as I went out, Father Joe Dunn was like to me, hi, Tony, I'm Father Joe Dunn. He says, um, I'm hearing Tony's thing. And, and then for a child, they don't get, you know, it's a blessing the child gets. It's not the last rites or anything like that. Tony at this time was only four and a half, as you know. And he was under this big flume thing and wasn't even in a ward. It was, it was, it was, it was, oh, it was a massive uh, place of flume he was under. And uh, he was chatting away to me and I said, he says, look, can I come in and give him a blessing and stuff like that? And, and at that time, as I say, although I was Catholic, I was, I was not going to my, I was not really brought up Catholic and Elizabeth was Protestant. So I went into Elizabeth and I said, look, there's a priest. She went, oh, of course, bring him in. And before he came in, he went in his pocket and he pulled out this mitten and it was a wee black mitten and the sort of fingers had been taken off the top of it. And he goes, Listen, Tony, I don't know if you've ever heard a, a famous monk. He said his name's Padre Peel. And I went, and I hadn't, if I'm being honest, I went, no, I haven't. He went, oh, well, he says, listen, this is a mitten Padre Peel where he says, no long story, he says, but he had the stigmata of Jesus. He had the wounds of Jesus, he went, and I believe in things. He says, and this is a mitten what he wore and stuff like that. Do you mind if I bless your son with this and that? And I went, I come in, so he came in under the flume and stuff like that and Elizabeth was there and he said hello and he went, do you mind if I, and Elizabeth said no, of course no, so he put Padre Peel's mitten over about Tony and uh, he said, listen, I'll leave you to it and he was going to go, he was going away to see other people, he said, I'll leave the mitten with you, so he gave it to Elizabeth and Elizabeth kept it on Tony and at times I took her turn as well to do that, so as I say, Incredibly, call it a miracle. If you, but it is to me because we'd been told, listen, he's going, he'll not make it through the night, more or less. 
till the next morning at quarter to ten, my son was sitting up in his bed drinking tea and toast, and the doctor came in, Dr. and he's like, this is phenomenal, uh, brilliant. He says, of course, they're thinking because they'd actually stopped the treatment, but they'd given them a lot of treatment as well, so a lot of people put it down to that treatment could have kicked in or whatever, but personally, I knew how Tony survived that night. So we were all delighted, and Tony had been in, he was still very unwell, you know, he was still, they had to still give him tests, and he was, everything, but he'd been in the hospital for <clears throat> a matter of six days or so, and again, I thought we were going to get him back home. He was looking quite good, although he was poorly, he was still looking quite good. So me and Elizabeth get taken in a room and it was Dr Willoughby again and uh, the sister and they says, listen, uh, Tony's done fantastic. Don't get it wrong, he's done brilliantly. Um, but we're sorry to say what, he's got acute myeloid leukaemia, which was, pff, that the word, so I'll never forget. But, in the days you're going away back, you know, 1980s, away back then, that was, you know, that was an adult form of leukemia in a child, which was very, very rare. And now they can do unbelievable things, you know, they can live a long life with leukemias and stuff. But in the days, that, that one especially was very uh, a strong leukemia for a kid. So as I say, um, we managed to get Tony home and proudly was a mask at St Mirren. Against Hearts, we drew one each. I always remember that game, and to, as I say, very proud of Tony being masked, and he loved going out. And people say I've got a special affinity with St Mum Football Club, and I have, and especially the supporters, because at your worst, worst times, and, I'm not, and that's the worst time ever, uh, the supporters of St Mum were incredible to me and my family. Um, they, they got Tony, uh, oh, the, the, the number of cars, no, I wanted to visit him, and they got him a big Alsatian. Uh, no, it was, wasn't a real one, it was a, a big uh, cuddly toy, and it was called Buddy, and um, it was just, in that day, he ran out to play against, uh, to, uh, to be the mascot with, with Hearts, was incredible, and we were getting beat 1-0, and I remember that day, Jed, and I was on the part, and I was desperate for us not to get beat, and I remember the, somebody came off and they put Alan Logan on, we Alshie Logan, who was a tremendous player. He, he would always come on as sub and score, but he was a really good player, wasn't he? Just a sub, but he came on that day in about seven minutes to go, so he scored a diving header for one each, and Tony was over the moon with that. So, um, And that was a, a fantastic time we had. But after that, Tony again relapsed and went in the hospital and he fought away and he fought away. So for the ages of four and a half to he was six and a half and uh, sadly he passed away, Jed, and he had fought a, an incredible fight. So, yeah, that was tough, yeah. Incredible story, Tony. Incredible yeah. story. Now, I know that the rainbow <sighs> plays a big part in your life, Tony, yeah. uh, around about that time, and it had, still does oh, to this day. Incredible. Tell us about that. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. The Padre Pio, I told you there the story about that. Well, the worst thing ever can happen to you in life is, as we all know, is, a, is losing somebody, an adult, but it's a child losing your, your son. And um, I mean, I always remember this, leaving Tony behind and we went down and went down the lift. And it's an incredible thing because I'm in there with Elizabeth in that lift and people are coming on. They don't know Tony's just passed away and they're talking away and laughing and you're looking about and I was, you can imagine Elizabeth was in despair, I was in despair. But I walked out of York Hill Hospital and we went into the car park and Jed, incredible this, right? I remember walking out and looking at the sky, it was a sort of, rainy, murky day, it was, it was a horrible day. Um, but as I looked straight ahead of me, was a massive, I mean massive rainbow, a double rainbow, right across the sky in front of us. And the colours, I mean, I'll be honest with you, I've never seen a rainbow, I've seen many rainbows since. So send you them, don't we? But, I've, yeah, you do, said <laughs> as well. Uh, the colours of this rainbow were unbelievable. But there wasn't that. I've just left my son behind, right? 
and yet, as you say, you're distraught. The emotions you can't even imagine. But as every time I looked at this rainbow, there was a, a lovely feeling, a peaceful feeling came through me. And um, I always remember getting in a car and going, of course, driving back to my mum's and dad's and stuff like that. But that's the, the rainbow thing and this rainbow thing, the rainbow story. And uh, I took that years later into uh, my life, the rainbow. No, so. Which we'll, we'll, we'll talk about. Yeah, yeah. Very, very powerful, Tony. Yeah. Uh, thank, thanks for sharing, sharing that with us. No, I love it's speaking a, about it. I know it's yeah, difficult. I know I get emotional, it's very, it's very yeah. difficult, and it's, uh, but, but thank you. Yeah. Now, you're a well-known dreamer. <laughs> Can we back to your d young days in Pozzle Park? Yeah. I bet winning the cup at Hamden as club captain yeah. was in a few of your dreams, Tony. But you made that dream come through. Tell us about that. Oh, that was a special, special day. And, and uh, for everybody associated with St. Martin Football Club and all the supporters and everybody, as you say, and I was very fortunate to play that day, and I mean, uh, um, to come on and play that day because I'd broke my jaw in two places uh, against Motherwell. I never played in any cup tie. I'd done my knee in as well, the way I'd felt. It was just going to be, and it looked as if I was going to miss out in that special time because I never had played any of the cup ties, the, the league games or anything. But Alex Smith, I've got to give, and Jimmy Bowen was assistant manager, and it was an incredible, as I say, I, w I followed the team all the way to, through the semi-finals and I thought I had no chance of playing in the final at all and Alex Smith came to me, I never had played uh, and, he's, and there was guys like Peter Godfrey and Paul Chalmers who had scored goals in that cup run who got left out that day and here was me, uh, never had kicked a ball, I'd only played half a game a couple of weeks before the cup final, there was a break against Rangers uh, and Alex Smith spoke to me and said, listen, uh, I want you to be involved in the game and whatever. So that was extra special for me and my family as well. No, And I always remember Billy Abercrombie, who was captain that day. I was club captain, but Billy was captain. And the two has been, a lot of people don't know this, but we were at a school in Mary Hill together, St. Clubbus of Iona. Uh, I was a year older than Billy. And the two years, one of the proudest moments was I had one, and there's a photograph of it actually, me holding the cup and Billy holding the cup, running to 30,000 St Mern supporters, the St Mern end of Hamden that day. And it was it was incredible, as you say, to dream about that and actually achieve it was incredible. You so know, dreams do come true. They do actually, Tony, and dreams yeah. do come true. I was in the St Mern end that day Fun. as a young boy and uh, watched, watched you winning the cup. Yeah. And, uh, Never in my wildest dreams I think we'd be sitting here <laughs> on camera telling yeah. the audience about your story. So dreams dreams do come through yeah. and uh, you oh, should always always follow your dreams. Yeah. You then became player manager of St Mirren yeah. and, you know, looking back at the time, um, you signed some big names. Share a couple of them with us. Yeah, there was, it was an incredible, as I say, after that uh, cup final and then a, a year later or so, I became player manager of St Mern. And I was always, again, I was only the age of, I just turned 31 or something at the time. And that's very young to be a manager, especially a player manager. And Frank McGarvey was going to be my assistant at the time. And uh, again, I had big dreams of taking St Mern into Europe, all the things he wanted to do. And... Uh, yeah, I signed, I think, the first players, to be fair, I, I did try to sign, my first players was Tommy Coyne, Keith Wright and uh, Kevin McAllister. That was my first three targets and St Mern had some money in their days as well because they'd sold, before I'd take over, they'd sold Dean Ferguson to Rangers, okay. Robert Taunt, I think, went to uh, Hibs. There was, there was money in the club anyway and that's how I made the bid for three of these players. Um, and never managed to, to get any of them. But we looked about again and I managed to bring in uh, Gunny Torveson, uh, Thomas Stickroth, and they're well known to the St Mern support now. They were well loved at, at St Mern. Um, actually brought in a, a Steve Archibald, who was an incredible player and a professional 
and there's quite a, just a quick story about that one. Uh, Stevie had signed him. He'd been uh, one of Scotland's leading scorers the year before and b brought Stevie in. And he said to me, Tony, you're looking for a midfield player? And we young Paul Lambert played with us at the time and Norrie McWhirter and players like that. And uh, I was more going to take a back seat. I played midfield. I says, aye, matter of fact, I'm looking for... He says, have you... If I heard them, he says, Victor Muno has done it. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, Victor? But it's just Victor one day. Uh, ah, he was Barcelona captain. He'd six Spades. Uh, Spades captain. Aye. And he'd, that year he'd went, uh, before he joined us, he played for Sampdoria with Viale and they'd won this, the European Cup Winners' Cup. And he went, oh, he says, Tottenham are interested. He says, but he's looking to learn English. And he says, because I'm here... So I, I says, oh, get us an introduction to him. So me and Stevie, in fact, that we went to meet him in Glasgow. He came over and I chatted away to Victor and uh, it was incredible. We, we managed to sign him. And I always remember bringing him into the club to show him uh, at Love Street. And as we came in, we are going up the stairs. I seen Paul Lambert and Norrie McWhorter at the bottom of the stairs. And I could hear Paul saying to Norrie, that's that guy, Victor. <laughs> and uh, so... We signed, uh, but there were some other great players we signed as well at the time. Uh, yeah, so that was my first... Your first uh, management. Answer, yeah. Now, there's a well-known saying in football. Yeah. I see it an awful lot. Yeah. You assure me um, yeah. you were the first to use it. I was, Share yeah. that with us, Tony. Yeah, as it's something I've always had in my mind uh, because I've seen talented players, more talented players uh, than myself that played football or some other players that played football it's not just about talent so I, I always thought of this saying was hard work beats talent only when talent doesn't work hard and uh, I used that quite a lot I had it up in my dressing room and uh, I'm so proud to say in the days clubs that used to play against Celtic and Rangers in Europe used to come and use St Mirren as a training ground and uh, it was Van Gaal had brought Ajax to St Myrne and Van Basten, all these guys were played at that time. And um, afterwards I always got an opportunity to maybe speak to the managers of these great clubs and uh, invited them in. They came into the, the home dressing room and we were having a cup of tea and uh, he looked up at the wall and he said to in the days it was video cameras more than then, it was near your fancy stuff. And he says, pointed it, he says, I really like that. I says, aye, it's the, the saying I've always had. And he asked, he says, can I, and he took a, a video of this and uh, he used it. And because many years later, Mark Guidi uh, done Arthur Newman's book, who played mm -hmm. for Holland and Rangers, of course, but he played for Holland. And we were sitting at a, a night out, uh, a footballer's night out, and uh, Mark Guidi was speaking away, Nathan Newman didn't really know me that well, so he went, Arthur, here's Tony, he says, uh, and it was in Arthur's book, Hard Work Beats Talent, Only When Talent Does Work, and he went, that's the guy there that brought that saying, and uh, that was no, saying. I was so proud of that, but it's a true saying to this day, yeah. no, talent's fantastic, yeah. but it's only great if they're willing to work hard. When I'm in and about the club, as I often am, yeah, um, yeah, as, yeah. as you know, um, and I've heard you saying this to many of the young players, yeah. don't let somebody else steal your place in history. That's a great saying. Yeah, thanks, Jay. Yeah, I, I do, I believe that, as I say, I, it goes away back to my days playing as a young kid. I was near the talented football and stuff like that, but there's one thing I think I'm remembered for has been really fit and I would give 90 minutes, I could run for 90 minutes and do all this. And uh, my, that was through my dad as well. He always used to say that to me, there's one thing you should do in football, Tony, when you're on that part, is run, run, run. And the supporters will always love you. They'll put up with you giving the ball away at times. They'll see you having bad games. But see if you're willing to run and chase lost causes and compete with people, they'll love you. And I always say that to young players, well, you're... As soon as you're finished training and you're going home or whatever, if that's the time to go and do extra training and do these things because while you're no training, somebody else is training, they'll take your place in history. So go and run. That's what it's about. Run. Talking about running, Tony, <laughs> is it true 
that Frank McGarvey's faster than you. <laughs> <laughs> I, know Frank. Where, uh, I know where this is coming from, this story. <laughs> and Frank tells this story as well. All different distances, we're all different runners. <laughs> but it was quite a funny story, and this is a true story. Uh, Alec Ferguson, Sir Alec used yeah. to take us up the brace for running, yeah. and Frank was very, very fit. And I like to think I was a fit and competitor as well. And it was the last run of the day, <laughs> and... Uh, yeah, if people know the braise, it was quite severe. So we, we run down the hill first, and then you come up, and then there's a hill to finish. And me and Frank are really fighting it together, and Fergie's at the top of the hill, and he's shouting, come on, we need a one act. Why's the land the trees are running? And Frank's with me, and the trees are head and head, but there's about maybe 50 yards to go or so. So I'm running, and my guard was a strong runner, I know. And uh, I've turned and I'm, I was getting tired <laughs> and I, as we're running. So it shows you and I goes, uh, and Frank looked at me. I went, we'll, we'll just run in together. And he went, what? And I went, we'll run in together. So as, as he turned to go, I just sprinted. <laughs> <laughs> and I won the race and he always goes, you did it. He, he always pulls me up, even uh, the last time we, we were together, together <laughs> weren't we? And he, he tells that story. But listen, my guard, what, what a oh my was, God, what a incredible, what, what a man. listen, he's incredible he's player. He's when you brilliant. think of the players, as I say, I don't want to mention, there's McAvenies and McGarvey's yeah. and stuff like McDougall's and what, uh, Dougie Somers, uh, that's Peter Weir, I could go through, there's millions of players yeah. in that. But McGarvey uh, was incredible. Uh, well, he's faster than though. Well, that's uh, that's, uh, that's, 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 that's I think it. I think maybe I think he is now. I think <laughs> I think he is now. Day is one of these days, and one of these one games <laughs> you can never miss. We can never miss. Oh, yeah, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Now, not many people got a second chance to manage this fantastic club, Tony. How yeah. did that come about? That's an incredible story, and my life seems to be full of these stories, but they're, they're true. And uh, I'd come back to St Mernley's Community Coach with the SFA and I, I loved that job. Uh, Jimmy Bone and Kenny McDowell were the manager of St Mernley at the time and they had a really young team. And uh, as I say, I was going around the schools and taking youth clubs and I loved the job. So uh, things weren't going too well. The, the team was doing okay, but Jimmy and Kenny, the directors wanted a change, so they left and um, Ian Monroe was given the job as manager, and I knew Ian really well. I'd played with Ian, and I'd done the same with Kenny and Jimmy. But anyway, uh, the director at that time, the chairman was John Payton at the time, and there was other directors, of course. So they'd picked Ian Monroe, and there was a game coming up uh, on the Saturday. So this was, they'd picked Ian on the Monday, say, or so, and... He had to, I think Ian had just left them firmly or something, so I never had spoke to Ian, but the, the chairman and I had spoke to me and said, listen, Ian's saying if you could take the training, Tony, could you do that this week? He says, and then he'll come in on uh, Friday afternoon after the press and speak with all the players and stuff. So I prepared the players that week and uh, it came to Friday. And if you know Love Street, there was a complex yes, behind right. that yeah. uh, with five-a-side football parks and stuff like that, and Jim up the stairs. But we'd finished our training the Friday, and the players looked pretty good, and uh, I, I'd said to them, listen, the manager's going to do the press, and the press started all arriving over in the other building, the main building, and I says, the, the manager, you know, come in after the press conference and chat with you guys, but I'd just like to thank you. I said, the, the, the effort you've put in this week's been incredible. So <clears throat> we sat and had a cup of tea, everybody, and we're chatting away, and... They were asking me about Ian as well because I'd played with Ian and Ian was a fantastic footballer and again one of the fit, fittest guys you'll come across with. Was he faster? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he probably was, yeah. Ian was a fantastic. And a really uh, student of the game, really mm. clever. Uh, and he'd been with Jim Leishman at Dunfermline, I think it was. And this was his big opportunity to take over as a manager of St Mum. But time was going on, Jed, as we're sitting there. I'm saying, this is strange. He should have been over by now. So I, the boys were getting restless as well. And I said, listen, lads, leave it there. I said, I'm going to nip across. I says to the main building, see how the press conference goes, and I'll bring Ian across. Uh, so uh, just quickly before that, I know John Payton had said to me as well, what Ian Monroe on the Friday afternoon would want to speak to me as well because he wanted me to be his assistant manager. So I says, look, I'll let Ian speak to me on that. So I've made my way across to the, the main building and... Uh, one of the directors comes out and he goes, oh, 
Tony there, you're there. He says, hey, come up, <laughs> come up the stairs. I'm saying, what's wrong? And he said, no, no, I just come up the stairs. And I seen all the press all in a room. They were all, all waiting. So I'm saying, that's strange. So I went into the, uh, the director's room and all the directors are sitting there and I could see John Payton, Charlie Palmer was a, a director that time, Alan Marshall, there was a, a few directors anyway. And uh, they were all sitting around the table and I could see there was something wrong. I went, guys, I says, what, what's wrong? I says, is he in? John Payton went, Tony, he's not coming. I went, what? And they said, no, he's... Uh, Jock Brown was his agent at the time or something like that. He says, listen, I think he's going to go to Wraith Rovers. He's no coming. I went, oh my God. I says, what's the boys? And they went, listen, we've had a discussion. That's what's kept us so long and stuff like that. Eh? We'd like you to be back. <laughs> <laughs> I'm dead, honestly. So I went, what? I went, no. I says, I'm no. I said, no. Because I, I generally wasn't at that time interested. And they says, oh, listen... Uh, John Payne and something else says, well, we've we'll leaked to, to the press, but <laughs> you're, you're, it looks if you're going to be manager. So I went, no, no. And I said, listen, calm down. I says, no. I, so I said, look, he says, take 10 minutes or so. So I went out and I stood and I, I thought, and I, I phoned Sir Alec and stuff like that at the time as well. And, phoned, and, and he sort of said to me, listen, it's a big opportunity for you, don't be afraid, take it, I mean, take your opportunity, you deserve it, and blah, blah, blah. So I went back in, I, I, I had a chat with him, I said, look, I'm willing to take it, but no, I need the support of all you guys, and they all said they would support me eh, with it. So that's how I became manager the second time. I believe you then moved on to Livingston, Tony, as Academy Director, yeah. but it's well documented, you lost everything. Must have been so hard to take. Yeah, very much so, Jed. Uh, if I could just take one wee step back before that, when I left St Myrne, uh, myself and Stuart McBean, who was a youth coach at St Myrne, yeah, youth, sure. and Stuart was a tremendous uh, okay. football coach, yeah. And the two of you sat down and we, we came up with the idea as a uh, total soccer experience. Because what we wanted to do, there was a lot of kids not getting opportunities in their days to maybe go senior or whatever. So what we did is, we done our own scouting, we went around all the Paisley teams, um, we tied in with Reed Care College, and it became a really good uh, opportunity for young kids to become senior players. What we do, me and Stuart, we'd train the players full-time in the morning, like if they were full-time players, and we'd go to Reed Care in the afternoon and do educational work and stuff like that. So that became very successful. Stuart still runs it to this day, um, total soccer experience. But it was a great time. We spent a few years together working on that. Then what happened is, because it was so successful, um, the Livingston Football Club, there was a guy called Tony Taylor, who's a guru in youth development, was leaving Livingston. And they were looking for somebody to replace him. And it so happened with uh, Wally Hockey and Dominic Keane, uh, Jim Leishman and David Hay were the managers of Livingston at the time, but they needed somebody who'd worked in youth and stuff. So they... They approached myself for that and uh, I took that opportunity to go through to Livingston and it was an incredible, I just sort of joined at the time, they just got up to the Premier League and uh, they were a fantastic club, everything was going unbelievable, I say Jim Leishman, David Hay had incredible success there, they ended up third in the league, went into Europe, won the League Cup, but my job was to develop young players and they had some fantastic talent uh, at the time with Robert Snodgrass, James McPake, Scott Boyd, um, James McCarthy, who actually went from Livingston to Hamilton, and they started to develop with Hamilton as well there. Um, there were so many young players, and I'm, I'm missing out many, because the young Paisley lad and all, Scott McLaughlin, who was a tremendous player, who played in the League Cup final at the age of 18 and won the League Cup final with, with Livingston. But as I say, things were going fantastic with that. And just like anything else, it seems to be in my life for a bit. Um, I loved that job, going well. And within that, um, there was going to be big developments at Livingston. You know, they'd built offices there, there to this day. But there was big plans ahead to do stuff there. And um, the academy was growing tremendously well, uh, everything. So... 
it was strange because what happened then is I, I started a company called Can Do. I always wanted to start a company called Can Do. You can do this and stuff. Uh, so what I did do was started to take all the the young players under Can Do and it was a model which through time Rangers started to use later on but that time this was the first time this had happened the first team players weren't in it or the management but all the all the other stuff uh, that's involved in running the football club was put into Can Do and that, I, I ran that um, and as you say I always remember it, it was going fantastically well and I, I put uh, a lot of my life savings into that as well and uh, I, I thought it was, as I say, it was going great. It was going that well actually. Uh, I started to invest in property and one of the things I always wanted to do was put my dad, uh, he was staying over in Rutherglen but he was born in Mary Hill and Oakway, he was a postal but he was born in Mary Hill and uh, it's called East End now and all that. So I bought a, believe it or not, Jed, I bought a penthouse for him and I was so proud. It was going to be an investment for me, but he could stay in that full time and that was him forevermore. And he, so that was my one of my proudest moments, being able to do that. But what happened then is, is it went on uh, about six months later, Livingston went into administration and that means as people know about administration and stuff, the place collapsed. Uh, I lost a lot and there was still some money left in the company uh, and Livingston had paid some of that money into the company, but I'd used a lot of my own money. And um, actually, I mean, at the end up, we, we paid the staff and stuff like that, make sure that they were okay. Um, but I'd lost everything. And you can imagine one when, when I'm saying that was one of the proudest moments with my dad, one of the horriblest moments in my life. Uh, I remember I'd, I'd, I'd a new partner at the time I'd split up with Elizabeth years and years before, but I'd I'd found a new partner, uh, Mags, no, uh, Mags McQueen's, and the two is um, lived together at that time, and I was working at Livingston, and she was fantastic with my dad as well. Looked after my dad was he he was always unwell, uh, but he was staying in this big, beautiful house. But with me losing everything, and me and Mags would have to sell our house, uh, and I would also have to sell my dad's house. So you can imagine going to this penthouse where my dad had been staying, and uh, having to tell him, listen, I need to sell this dad. No, So anyway, I'd always remember that, uh, Mag said to me, he's wanting me to come with you and talk. I said, no, I'll go and see my dad myself and explain it to him. So I always remember going up and uh, up into the penthouse, as I say, and the living room was massive and there was big telly and all the thing. My wee dad was sitting there and I always remember going up and I was shaking and he'd sort of heard rumours about the Livingston thing and he said to me, eh, you okay, son? And stuff like that. I was like, hi, dad. I said, listen, but you know the situation that's been at Livingston, no, I says, and you know the sort of investment and the stuff, and he's like, yeah, yeah, I do. And I went, um, listen, and he could see I was struggling, and he goes, you okay? And I went, listen, Dad, I want to sell this house. And I thought, the words were so hard coming out to say to him. And he looked at me and he went, he swore, but I'm, so I'm not going to swear, but he went, thank God, son. It was a swear. He went, "Thank God, son." He says, "I don't like it up here." <laughs> he says, this, "This is no me. This is that." He says, "I know it's been hard for you, but he says, I, I'm delighted." I says, "Listen, I'll make sure you get a, a wee hootable there." And my dad, we got him into a sheltered house, and he loved it up to he passed away. He'd, no years later, but he, and that was such a relief coming out. But what I will say is, if I can carry on with a story. I remember going back after that, and we did have to sell stuff, um, but I didn't want to put can do down. I wanted to hold that, so I paid the debts, what I had to do and whatever, and uh, it sat there, can do. But you know something, I always thought, no, I come true, my son, 
passing away, I come through, everybody does, this is no sympathy, I'm looking for, everybody goes through hard times in life, and I used to be very proud that I thought I could handle anything, but see, after that happened to me, and I understand what people talk about now, depression, and a black tunnel and stuff like that, why well, know it exists, because I went through that, I actually went into that, for over a year nearly, I was, I mean, in a place was horrible. I just, I didn't, and I've got to give my great credit here. Uh, we actually had to move in with Maureen, her um, great friend. Uh, we moved into her house where we couldn't afford anywhere else. And I was really went into a bad place and depressed. Mags had two jobs going to keep us going. Um, I'd put on masses amount of weight. I'd lost the will. I couldn't. I couldn't get them. I couldn't get myself going. So yeah, this went on, as I said, for a long time, and uh, my life changed one day. It's incredible how things happen, though. I remember lying up on the couch. Mags is at work. Maureen's at her work. Uh, one of her best pals at her work. And I was watching the Jeremy Kyle show. People remember that. And I remember looking and going, they're talking about their lives and all that. They don't know what life's about. Look what I'm going through. And I got up, Jed, this is a true story. And I walked into the bathroom. And there was a mirror on the wall in the bathroom. And I remember looking into that mirror. And I was going to take a shower because I hardly ever showered because I'd lost the will to even do anything. And I looked at this mirror and I looked at my face and I caught my face. In the mirror, and I looked into my eyes, and I was looking at someone saying, "You're some state, son. Look at you." And I remember talking to myself if I was, if I was daft, you know what I mean. But I was going, and I could see my eyes were full of uh, self pity, anger, bitterness. My, that's what I was fully. But something clicked in my head when I was looking at this, thinking, "You're a disgrace, Tony." You've seen young players, you were knocked back as young players yourself. You've had to tell young players their dreams not going to come true. But what was the thing you always said to them is, but never give in, don't pick yourself up and get on with it. And you know, I turned for that mirror, I went, got training gear on, got my training shoes on, and I started to walk. And I started to walk every day. And the more I walked, my mind became clear and I'm thought, I'm coming back now and I started to lose weight a bit. And as you say, changing my life, what I did one day is I started getting interested again. What, what am I going to do with my life? I, I know. So I went into Glasgow one day and I used to love walking about bookstores and stuff. And there was a big bookstore called Borders there. It's not there anymore. But I walked into it and as I walked in, I looked and there was this number one bestseller, and it was like a wee uh, orangey looking book, that's the way I could describe it, and it said The Secret on it. And uh, I picked this book up and I started to read it a wee bit, and it started talking about visualisation, your dreams, what you think about, negative thoughts, positive thoughts, you know, the law of attraction it's called, what you think about, if you think bad thoughts, then bad will come to you if you think good. So I went, but it hit home in me because it's talked about shutting your eyes and dreaming and stuff. I went, I don't know this. So I invested £10, which was a lot of money in the days to buy this book. 9 99 it was. But as I walked, and you know, incredible thing happened. As I walked out with this wee book, I walked into the street and I bumped into a, a great pal at the time um, whose son used to be at Livingston, Michael Lynch. And Michael went, How are you doing, Tony? How's things? I went, Oh, Michael, how are you? And he, he, he's going, uh, so what are you doing with yourself? And I was embarrassed. I mean, I was going, I says, nothing, Michael. I says, don't he went, are you working? And he went, I know what happened at Livingston to you. And I went, aye, because they don't know. And his son had, Sean had played at Livingston. And uh, I went, no, I'm not working. I says, but listen. And he went, don't remember, we spoke ages ago, he says, about taking an idea to football clubs uh, about supporters, support employment, where, where supporters who are unemployed go to their favourite football club and spend time there and you're part of the family at a football club. I went, I went, well, I've been doing that for a year now. 
He says, in the minute Celtic and Rangers, I went, Mike, what's your joke? Because we'd always spoke about this. And he says, um, aye. He says, I'm with Career Scotland. He says, I'm building this programme up. He says, um, listen, Tony, he says, I'm not, he says, I can't promise you a job. He says, but why don't you come to the two programmes and be a participant in them? He says, I can get you on there. I says, I'm not confident enough even to go into these things. And he went, listen, why don't you come? He said, we do uh, Celtic, Celtic Park. They were the only two that was going, Celtic and Rangers. Monday afternoon, um, sorry, Monday at Celtic, Tuesday Celtic and Wednesday morning, and then you go Wednesday afternoon, Thursday and Friday at Ibrox. And he went, take the chance, Tony, come. We'll, we'll gradually build you into it. And I went, right, okay, I, I, I. So I went along and I took part in the two courses and I started to get more confident. I wasn't here at first because, as I say, the motivational speakers coming in are people uh, like, no, uh, McDonald's, people from McDonald's would come in and talk about how that, and maybe I'd, I'm saying, maybe I got a job in there or maybe I could do this or that. And uh, as time was going on, I was getting more confident and a job centre plus there was a, a guy there um, who came into the courses and one day I'd done 10 weeks with Celtic 10 weeks with Rangers took part in that and then I'd done it again because I had no job or I didn't feel uh, there was a job I could go to and uh, as I say all this time Mags is supporting that and looking after my dad as well who was unwell but what I, what I then did is the last time I was sitting at I sat down with Michael and the guy for Job Centre Plus and he says, um, listen, uh, Tony, we want to take this out to Scotland. He says, all the football clubs, he says, and I know you know most of the managers and stuff like that. He says, I, I could give you a job if you can get all this into other football clubs. So I went, aye, I'll do my best to do it. So that's what I did. I brought it to St Myrne here, brought it to them firm. I brought it to all the football clubs help get it in and people then would deliver it. So from there, as I said, I, I, I get a great lift. And my last two days, I think, uh, and I knew I was going to get this job, Michael says, listen, come with me to the uh, Healthy Living Centre over in the East End of Glasgow. Yeah. Crown Point, it's called. <coughs> And as we were walking, we were going to book rooms over there, the trees were walking, and then we're, as I'm walking in, on the left-hand side, there's a football park, and there was a lot of kids playing football. Say kids were sort of like 18-year-olds not playing, and it looked quite rough. The game was going on, and it was pace, and people were shouting, and the usual swearing. And I seen Polis standing about, I'm going, what's that? So I goes into the uh, East End Hill to Centre anyway, so I goes in there, and uh, me and Michael are waiting, and uh, there's a guy, the, a, a police guy called Andy Mackay, you know, so he'd sort of spoke to me, he'd said, hi, Tony, how you doing? But, and I went, Andy, how you? I didn't know, I'm sorry, at that time. I went, ah, how are you? And he went, oh, is this a mum support? And this and that. And he went, do you want any days a favour? Would you go over and speak to the boys over here? And I went, no, I don't know, no, me. No, this and that. So anyway, me and Michael went across and... They, were, they sat down and I started speaking to him and I mentioned Alec Ferguson's name and you know the usual stuff, and all the boys are like, ah, you don't know Ferguson. And one of them, there's mobiles at this time, but then, and he's just going, hey, hey, by the way, he did play under Alec Ferguson, so it gave you a wee bit of credit. Aye, and, aye. and from there, I, st I started the company. Well, what had happened is they'd asked me uh, what sort of work I was in and you were always told in support employment if an employer asks you, can you do this? Say to them, yes, I can do it. Because you always learn it. No. And I always remember Andy speaking, saying, Tony, that was great there, he says. And I took them a wee training session. And we went, do you, have you, is this the sort of work you do? And I could see Michael looking at me, I have to say, aye. aye. And I went, yeah, I'd, I'd do that. And <laughs> so I went for there and uh, I started Can Do Back Up again. And I, I worked with the gangs. Say gangs, it is gangs, uh, but the boys don't look upon it as gangs, they look upon it as they're running about their piles. But I worked in the East End of Glasgow for many years uh, and I had fantastic time. The gangs over there, the rebels, the wee men, there's so many names over there. But I worked and um, they were, I gave them fit boy as well, but we, we, we tried to get them a job and uh, 
and it just sadly a, a few months ago that, that no, I had can do at the time, but there's a guy called Paul Kelly who and his wife Carol who ran sidekicks and Paul sadly died and I think MD knows in football the the tributes he's got thing and, and me and Paul we can do and sidekicks and the Banbury Centre all work close together to help the boys and girls over there and they stand to try and get away from that lifestyle and get jobs and do other things through the violence reduction unit, yeah. which was fantastic. Tony, you're now author of four books. That must make you so proud. <sighs> Shocked when you even mention the word author. It's, um, as you know, my background and education-wise and the dyslexia and stuff, but um, they were very, the, the Baba Kutcheber books, the, the Promise Together Again and The Dream You Can Do This. Uh, the one uh, autobiography, Fitzy, um, is Norman MacDonald, which is in, that's what you call an author. Norman MacDonald is a fantastic writer and uh, he captured the story really, really brilliantly. The other book is Oasis of Peace, with a, a good friend as well, Joe Livingston. He's played a big part in my life, going back to my uh, faith. And um, the two of wrote that book together, which is fantastic. And as I say, Joe played a big part in me coming back into my faith and belief in God again, uh, which is massive. And uh, Joe I met through, I was doing a talk and uh, here at St Mern actually and Joe worked in the shipyards and he listened to my story and stuff when I was telling things and afterwards he, he, he put something in my hand um, and after everybody opened up and it was a picture of, uh, I know we'll talk about religion but the mother of God was in my hands, the lady of all nations and she had her arms open and I've always for a young kid I had a special devotion to her blessed mother and uh, it intrigued me, so I, I, I gave Joe a phone, he'd left me his number, and uh, we spoke away, and he spoke about a place called Medjugorje. Most people have heard they probably Lourdes in Fatima, but there's a place called Medjugorje in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, Croatia way, and uh, I went there with Joe, and uh, changed my life, really. It really changed my life and everything, and... Uh, I'm happy to say when it changed my life, I met the love of my life, the now uh, Maureen. Uh, me and Maureen uh, together, um, we've been together now for a few years, and we met through uh, church, and we go to Medjugorje together, and uh, I'm, as I say, I'm the happiest man in the world, I've got Maureen now, so so that was um, how the the last book, The Oasis of Peace, all followed through that, and I've ended up yeah, yeah, I've, yeah. I've, I've read I've read all your books, Tony. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but just taking it back a little yeah. bit as well, you talk about Baba Kuchi. Yes. What's the kind of story behind Baba Kuchi, Tony? Well, that's the we talk about again. As I say, when Tony had passed away, and we go back to the rainbow. This was a, a story again. When I always thought, when me, Elizabeth, and Lorraine get back into Thornley Park and stuff like that after losing Tony. Um, we never really could speak about it properly. And Lorraine was only eight years of age and she was so close to her brother and I couldn't really speak to her about Tony. And we were all the same. Even when you went out the house and walked along the road, neighbours were frightened to speak to you. So they'd cross the road because they didn't want to hurt you or bring up. And um, but I always had an idea because I loved telling my kids stories. I loved telling nighttime stories and make-up stories and stuff like that, but I couldn't really write them down properly. But I always wanted to do something because people with bereavement and losing people couldn't really speak about it. I thought, especially kids, I thought, Tony, I used to, Tony had, when he was born, I called Lorraine Babacucci, but Tony, when he was born, looked like a wee berry, had plenty of hair, for a, 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 a you know, furry, awful hair and I used to think Baba Coochie Bear so that was Tony I used to call him that nickname Baba Coochie Bear uh, the rainbow of course when I said when I went out the hospital the rainbow's there and uh, Tony loved to be he wanted to be a footballer and uh, he used to walk about to get treatment whether it be 
blood or plasma, he'd, he'd walk about with a stand and kick the ball about and walk about. And I thought, well, he can't walk about with a stand, so Babacucci Bear, the rainbow. Uh, my brother Tom and Elaine are, are great uh, people. Uh, um, they're involved in Allenton House, the World Peace Prayer Society, and there's a thing called the Peace Pole, a wooden pole, which has got a beautiful message in it, May Peace Prevail on Earth. So I started to think one day, and I'm thinking, I could bring this to life in terms of helping parents and kids to deal with bereavement. So Baba Kutche wears a superhero to us all, and that's Tony really. But when he places a peace pole on the ground and says, May peace prevail on earth, a beautiful double rainbow appears, and Baba Kutche would take adults, but mainly children through the rainbow, to talk about any issues they had, whether it would be bereavement, whether it be bullying, anything like that. It was really working through children's hearts to change the world. So I managed to do The Promise Together Again was about, and I'd done it through bears really, no, uh, Baba Kutche Bear and Sabre, who had lost his son. It was more or less my story. And Baba Kutche takes the bear through to spend a day with his son again and talk about bereavement and talk about things that's happening now. So, and that was a real breakthrough for me, uh, The Promise Together Again. And I'm going to have, when we talk about <laughs> the second book, Jed, I'd like, oh, I know, I hope I can bring this up. I know, I'm, and I don't mean to embarrass you with it, but, and it's been fantastic, was uh, I didn't want Tony just to be remembered as uh, bereavement and death and passing and stuff, although that's a, that's a positive thing as well, uh, believe it or not. Um, and I was sitting with you one day and uh, we were chatting away and I'm saying, oh, I'm going to write a second book, but I'm trying to come up with things and I always remember a light bulb moment. You turn around Jen and says, have you never thought of writing a, a football book, the football story and stuff? And it was a real light bulb moment. I went, no. And I went home and I started to think and I thought, do you know what? I know Tony was young, but I went through, I could put myself into Tony because he wanted to be a player getting all the disappointments that's what happened too small too thin no quick enough no good enough all the things and I wrote that the, uh, it's called The Dream You Can Do This and anybody can do it it just doesn't have to be football because in the book as well it's about young girl wanting to be a singer it's about people wanting to be actors whatever you want to be in life you can do it no you, you can do it it's hard work you no, know, people say it's okay the visualization, closing your eyes and dreaming about it. But it's not just that, you've got to then go and do the hard sacrifice, the hard work to get your dream. So that was the Babacucci, that's how it all came about. Absolutely fantastic, Tony. I've, re I've read all the books. And then for the viewers watching the, the show tonight uh, and the, the credit screen at the end, there will be, be information because I would recommend. Everybody, there's something there for everybody. If I can see the Baba Kutcher Bear books are all for charity, yeah. they all, it all goes to good causes. Yeah, and I, I know you, you put money back into yeah. a good cause, which is which is absolutely fantastic. Now, currently you're CEO of St Mirren. You came yeah. up, you, you joined here a way back when you were 12 years of age, yeah. uh, which was a few years ago. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, when you became CEO in 2016, the club were rock bottom of the championship, which is the second tier in Scottish football. Yeah, yeah, so when you think back, Jed, you're right. Uh, I came in, uh, Brian Caldwell, who was a fantastic chief executive here, um, had left to go to Shrewsbury, and um, as I said, my dad, I just had both losing my dad at the time, and uh, I met Stuart Gilmer and Brian McCausland. I really, Brian McCausland, we had a coffee together and I was chatting away, and it just, again, one of these light bulb moments when we spoke about um, St Mirren and stuff like that and he says oh we're looking for somebody to, to come in and this and that and Brian's like I'm talking here Tony you could be that uh, thing so Brian McCausley then spoke to the rest of the board and I got interviewed like anybody else and uh, yeah I got the job and um, it was great I just had started but as you know the club was Stuart and uh, George Campbell um Brian McCausland and them were looking and Gordon Scott was, uh, I think he just had left the, the board, as, but they were looking to sell the club, Ken McGeoch was another director, uh, they were looking to sell the club at the time and um, 
Gordon who had left as a director actually was a great St Mern supporter and done really well in business. So within a few months, Gordon then wanted to buy the club and they, they came to an agreement uh, that he would buy this club and uh, Gordon, we had a meeting with Gordon as well and uh, we, we spoke, because I was just into the club and of course this was a new owner yeah. going to come in and uh, Gordon said, no, I want you to really stay, we could work together and uh, build the club back up and uh, Gordon done fantastic, as I said, uh, invested yeah. a lot of money in the club, but behind it all was the two of had the same dream it to be fan owned one day and that was Gordon no he made that investment in the club but was going to give it back to the fans through time and I'd bought into that as well I, that was something that was always going to be a dream for the the, uh, the the fans to own the football club so yeah we worked away and it was as you say it's um I'll be coming up for six years I can't believe that six no years. Uh, okay. two years of Covid which has been incredible yeah. but you're right we were down at the bottom the, the the league and um, as I say things started to progress a bit um, Alec Ray was manager and then Jack Ross came in and of course there's always plans ahead when you become CEO and we, we always spoke Gordon we was all we said listen a five year plan everybody's got five year plans but through Jack Ross and I've got to give him great credit um, he catapulted the club into Premier League within a year and a bit. Yeah. No, he was an incredible manager. And uh, personally, I always want in the Premier League, as you know, in top six and all the things. And I have the ambitions. Everybody's got that ambition for the club. But we got into the Premier League very quickly uh, before we'd actually put yeah. things in place. So that was hard as well. That was going to be difficult. But I'm proud to say, no, before shutdown there, we were two goals short of European football, really because we would have ended up sixth place, two semi-finals, Jim Goodwin and his manager, who has to take all the credit for that. Yeah. We've all worked hard in the background, all the directors here. Yeah. I think Jim's well known in saying that. No, everybody's supported him at the football yeah. club. And I've got to, as I say, part of my job as CEO was um, to try and bring in a partner who was going to realise all these ambitions for the football club. And because, to be fair, no, Gordon was going to pass it over to the fans. There was going to be a time it was going to be fan-owned. Yeah. and But you need a lot of money to run a football club and you need the right people to run the football club. So part of the job was to me to look for a partnership which could help. So I looked about different companies, had meetings with different, and I, made, I had a chance meeting... Funny enough, in a coffee shop with Matt McMillan, uh, the kibble, and I get chatting to him, and he says, I must have sort of had a note with him. And he says, Listen, we've got Chief Exec Jim Gillespie, I'd like you to get a meeting with him. Um, so I had a meeting with Jim, and Jim was incredible, young, dynamic guy. Uh, you see what kibble's achieved. Uh, so, but he became excited with St. Mern, and I thought, You need to meet Gordon, and we. Um, introduced him into Gordon and we walked through the stadium and you get the real buzz for the whole thing and um, and for me it was the perfect partnership because the Kibble uh, is a fantastic institution and pays little likes and none the same morals values in life no helping people and all, all, the, all, all that all joined in together and the resources the Kibble's got not just money but everything they're about young people as well, giving young people a chance in life. Uh, and that's what St Mern's about, Family Community Club. So it was a perfect partnership. And as I say, uh, I'm, and I'll say that I'm delighted Kibble are part of St Mern Football Club. Uh, and I've got to give great credit. I've, I've, lent, I've leaned a lot on Jim Gillespie at Kibble. He's a chief executive. I'm learning. I'm more a football sort of guy, but I want to learn the business. And you see the success they've had, so I've taken a lot of lead off of the sort of his business acumen and these things. So, but I've got we've got a great board of directors here. I've got to say that, and you go back to the beginning of Fish Stewart Gilmer, not him, 
done magnificent for this football club, selling Love Street, which was a heartbreak at the time. But you see this beautiful stadium, then Gordon coming in, and now as fan owned, the supporters, supporters. the supporters, and, and you were saying you were saying early on in the interview how how yeah. good the supporters have been to you, yeah. and I know how you feel about these fantastic Listen, fans. This is people Incredible. know words are easy to say, Jed, but that see when you speak for your heart, and this this comes from my heart. As I say, from my son to now, uh, it's been an incredible journey. And the fans, uh, and we've just we've all suffered that the last two years, no having them here, but and they've still supported the club. They've been incredible, and I know they, they know I'm all patronising. I'm looking no. for parts in the back. I don't, I don't need that. I speak from my heart when I talk about St. Martin, and especially our supporters. No, and the support they've not just given me; they've given the whole club the support. It's a special place, and we've we've got special staff in here as well. Do you know what I mean there's? There's so many good people in it, St Martin, and this is a, no, we were on our, we were on our way, as they say, the St Martin way, we were there, we were getting there, and COVID is happening, it's hit most people, yeah. but it's been a, a dramatic effect in this football club, yeah. make no mistake, but we've survived it and we always will survive it. Yeah, you have indeed, and I noticed this week as well, or last week I was reading the papers that uh, you've got obviously a great academy, because oh. I'm in about the club all the time, and what, you know, what, what, what a status now, eh? Well, this is one of the biggest achievements as well. No, St Mun, even for Fergie days, who set up a youth programme all the way through, and David Longwell took it on as well, and look at the, the success that Mun had under him, the yeah. young players, the McGinns and all that. But I've got to say now as well, how do you follow that on? And I've got to give Alan McManus and his staff uh, incredible credit for the way that the academy, I hate this word elite, mm -hmm. but to get to that level in football now in an academy, because you're talking about Celtic and Rangers and the monies they put in, we've got elite status now. And you can see some of the young players that are coming through now. And I'm not going to start mentioning one or two because yeah. there's that many of them, yeah. honestly. This club has got so many young players and you've heard the manager speak of them. Yeah. But I go back to Alan McManus, the... The thing he's put in place here, himself, Andy Webster, Mike McCardo, Ross Patterson, Craig McLeish, again, uh, we've made a, an incredible signing. Uh, we've brought Michelle Evans in. We're the first club ever to have a an operation, a, a well-being, uh, I don't know the word officer, it's more than that. I mean, it's a, I'd say well-being director. No, everybody in this, this is how much we care for our, our people. Support us, but Michelle's not just the academy, she's about the first team, about all the staff, myself included in that. Uh, because it's been a hard time, COVID, for everybody. Yeah. And the young players, we talk about mentality and what they've been through. Uh, it's just, as I say, the academy now is producing top class players. Yeah, and I, I, I'm lucky enough over the last few years uh, in and around the club, Tony, doing different stuff with it. Um, but I notice as well, it's it's it's, it's a community club without oh. a shadow of a doubt. And a special mention must go to to Gail and the charity charity foundation. You know, giving giving the meals and making sure people get stuff at Christmas time. So they do so much, oh, yeah. not just for yeah. for the local community yeah. and beyond. I'm glad you mentioned that, yeah. Ted, as well. And I never forgot this because. The foundation is an incredible Amazing. Gail Brannigan, who's come in. She's chief exec yeah. there as well, and you no, know, proudly she went and she got a great award there and through Parliament and stuff like. That. She took her wee mum along with her. So, but Gail, the amount of work that they've put in is unbelievable. You no, know? and of course we. Part of that as well, street stuff. We've got to give that a mention so as well. Much. That's so, so Listen, so you much. say family community club. That's what it is. All the way, Jed. Th all yeah, the way through. That's Tony. what it is. Yeah. All the way through, Tony. Finally, <laughs> we've all the way through it. But you, you've come all the way through it, Tony. To being a painter, to coming here as a twelve-year-old, to been made club captain just before your eighteenth birthday, captain the club to the Scottish Cup. Becoming player manager, going away, coming back and being manager again, going away, coming back 
and been CEO. What an incredible life you've led, Tony. Un unbelievable. Now, they say people say you were streets ahead. So much so, they've named a street in Paisley after you, which will be there forever more. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. it's Patrick Way. <laughs> You've always shown true grit, through good times, through bad times, but you never let it get you down. You always get up and go on with it. So much so, they've named a gritter after you in Paisley. <laughs> Tony, <laughs> Gritt, Tony Gritt's Patrick. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And people often say, and I'll say from my heart, because I know you very well, you're a standout as a human being. So much so, they've named a stand after you here at this fantastic stadium, Tony Fitzpatrick Stand, and you'll live on forever. Because your story, a lot of people watching this maybe never heard your story, but I'm sure the viewers will be gripped to this, Tony. You're an absolute gentleman and a true friend. Thank you so much for your time. Jed, thank you so much. I've enjoyed the journey. Thank you so much. Incredible. That's our show for Chit Chat with Jed & Co from St Mirren Football Club. Can we ask you please subscribe free to our YouTube channel, comment and give us a like. Thank you for watching. <laughs>